Good day, friends. Welcome both to our audience here in person that braved the blizzard and also to our audience online, our, our live streaming audience. It is good to see all of you. Um, we are in for a real treat today. Uh, let me begin with a word of welcome. Welcome to today's Lawrence and Center event. My name is Michael Chan and I am the Executive Director for Faith and Learning here at Concordia College. Uh, overseeing the Lawrence and Center really is one of the great delights and joys and cherished responsibilities that I have. The Center honors the life and the work and the legacy of Norman M. Lawrenson, renowned philanthropist, former CEO of Burlington Northern, alumnus of Concordia College, and former member and chair of its board of regents. Throughout his life, uh, Norm helped to build a more joyful, just, and trustworthy world. And in honor of that legacy, the Lawrenson Center takes up this question, how do we build a more trustworthy world? In order to learn a little bit more about the Lawrenson Center, you can uh, visit us at our website, lawrencecenter.com. And while you're there, I would encourage you to subscribe to the newsletter. I understand that some of you had some difficulties receiving the newsletter itself. Uh, those have been resolved, those technical issues, and so hopefully you should be receiving those on a, num on a regular basis. We try to get one out a week, and uh, the, the purpose of the newsletter is to let you know about events like this, but also to let you know about our podcasts and also other interesting resources that we might uh, come across. Today's speaker is Dr. Paul Jupe. He is Associate Professor of Political Science at Denison University in Granville, Ohio, where he not only teaches but also directs the Data for Political Science program. A product of Lutheran higher education, <laughs> Dr. Jupe received his BA from Gustavus Adolphus College and an MA and PhD from Washington University, St. Louis. He is an affiliated scholar with 
the Public Religion Research Institute, otherwise known as PRRI. This is an incredible uh, kind of data collection and analysis institute that I encourage all of you to look into, and, and Paul um, uh, is, uh, is, is affiliated with them. He's also the editor of Religious Engagement and Democratic Politics series with Temple University Press, and he was co-editor of Politics and Religion from 2011 to 2016, and runs two blogs, a religioninpublic.blog and 127.blog. Now, I want to say something about 127. We were just talking about this. This is an incredible project, actually. 127 really serves as a data mirror for the Denison University campus. So the blog publishes articles on empirical, social, and institutional patterns at Denison that are of interest to the community, help challenge or affirm conventional wisdom, and reflect on the institution's practices and attitudes. So for example, the blog has entries in response to questions like, are Denisonians in a political bubble? Interesting question. Or is there social pressure on conservatives at Denison? And then thirdly, and maybe most importantly, how do Denisonians feel about lacrosse on campus? <laughs> it is, even if you don't have any connections to Denison, I encourage you to check out the blog, just because there's a lot to learn there about life on a college campus, and I, I commend Paul for the, for the good work. So, um, Dr. Jupe, welcome to Concordia College. We look forward to hearing your talk and the subsequent conversation, so thank you. Yeah, thanks uh, so much for having me, and I, I have to extend uh, uh, thanks to the Lawrence Center, of course, to Michael to reaching out. I'm not quite sure how you found me, but uh, but I really appreciate the opportunity to come and, and speak to you about um, these concerns. I'm going to you know, kind of glance at the at the kind of core question that motivates this series and focus just a little bit more on um, my bread and butter, which is religion and politics. So lovely summer day here in Moorhead. Um, <laughs> I, I really, I really, so uh, I went to Gustavus, right? Um, so I appreciate the tolerance that you have for, for Augusti, um, even though we're, we're, we're uh, uh, rivals, and of course a Swede, which is the other side of, of the divide. Um, my, my, name, um, my name means uh, deep in Swedish, which is of course perfect for a professor. But it only, so interesting, it only has an E on the end in Norwegian. Um, so the story that at least my family tells is when Gust Joop came uh, through Ellis Island, there was a bloody Englishman that said, if you have a long vowel sound in your last name, it has to have an E on the end. Um, and so we always blame this Englishman for the way that our name is spelled, because it obviously has an E. But actually, there might be a Norwegian tale in there that nobody wants to admit. Um, so it could be a cover-up. I, I was so excited about thinking about um, Swedish and Norwegian rivalries that I almost was going to tell an Ole and Lena joke. Um, I don't get to tell this to people in, in Ohio. They have no idea what I'm talking about, um, but I'm not going to. So um, if I start talking about that time when Ole and Lena were driving back from the Twin Cities, you just tell me, no, you said you weren't going to do that. All right. Now to serious things. Um, I like to begin talks um, and especially my religion and politics class with what I think of as the first facts. And I think the, the most important one, um, just to kind of frame this big conversation, uh, concerns the big decline. And so this is the, the notion that the US was once a great Christian nation and since it's has sort of slid to, to Gomorrah, that's becoming more corrupt and degraded as we hurtle toward the end times tribulation period. My head is really in apocalypticism these days, so if you want to talk about that, I'd, I'd love to do so um, afterward. Actually, an alarming number of people believe that we're actually living through the end times right now. Um, so I don't have data about society's morals over time, but I do have data about adherence over time. So let's start with a little audience participation. What was religious affiliation, what rate was it, what percent of Americans were affiliated with a church at its founding in 1776? I want to hear a guess. 98. Anybody want to go higher? <laughs> I got 100. Anybody want to go lower? 75. 50, 20, 20. $1, um, <laughs> wait, not this one, but this one, uh, 
In about 1776, it was about 17%. So these are sociologists who went through all the church records they could find and counted how many people were there compared to the population. 17%, the high water mark, it doesn't quite finish there because um, I got lazy and just used an old graph, but um, it was actually 1990 and it hit about 62%. So the exact opposite of the great decline is the way that, that religion has tracked um, over time. So really important, I think, to think about, as we think about political challenges and resilience, some think that democracy is inimical to religion. And in fact, that's the opposite of what happens, not just in the United States, but also in countries around the world. The more that freedom is enshrined in constitutions, the more that religion tends to thrive. It's definitely true. Um, in the United States. Okay. So um, I took an, an oath when I became a professor that I would work in threes, um, just like clergy, I believe. So these are the three uh, political challenges that I wanted to deal with today. Um, don't, don't get too worried. The first challenge is going to take a while to process, and then the last two um, go a little bit more quickly. So the three are the challenge of tolerance, so increasing tolerance in the United States, the challenge of politicized religion, and then the challenge of an ever-present politics in um, our social lives. So I want to start and riff off the, um, the tolerance that you showed me, and I think that's, uh, that's the tolerance that you're showing me, and I'll start with just a little bit of quick family, family history. So there was only one place where my grandfather, Walter Johnson, could um, go for, uh, for his college education and um, training as a clergy person, and that was North Park College and Seminary in Chicago. This is the only institution that's affiliated with the Swedish Covenant Church, and so that's where he went. In his churches in the 1920s, he was still preaching in Swedish. He was an early adopter of radio where he preached his fire and brimstone sermons. Um, and so, of course, it was natural that when it was time for his offspring to attend a college, just much to their credit, in the 1940s and 50s, um, uh, they also went, except for the black sheep, um, they also attended North Park. Somehow, those kids avoided the preacher kid curse and did not get in trouble in school and life. Um, but they also didn't speak Swedish, and they also didn't live in Swedish enclaves, which were fading at that point anyway. And of course, I already told you, you already know the punchline to this mini-series is that when Anne Marie Johnson's son, Paul Aaron, that's me, I felt free to not even think about consider North Park as a possibility and instead went to, you know, a college that seemed livable at least in July when I visited. We had a tundra too, so it was just like this, of course, uh, yeah, at Gustavus. So what does this have to do with, with religion? So what the growing political and especially social tolerances that weakened their both speaking a different language and living amongst um, ethnocultural similars meant that there was a great decline of boundaries in this boundaries, especially among whites. So I'm gonna bracket race here. This is mostly gonna be a white story that dynamics in African-American community are obviously different because of structural racism. I can still say that in Minnesota, right? That's, we can talk about structural racism here. It's becoming unpopular around the, around the country. That's, that's the little joke. So I try to be funny. It's just not in my background. Swedes aren't funny, right? All right, so we got this great decline of boundaries. Um, so post-World War II, we also have uh, increasing um, identity, a unifying identity of the war, as well as the great upward mobility um, posed by the GI Bill that did so much for college education, which of course is liberalizing, individualizing in terms of identity as well as home ownership that fueled the rise of the suburbs and the breakup of those formerly ethno-religious city neighborhoods. So I think, you know, the, the huge Polish population in Chicago, that meant that we got to celebrate Casimir Pulaski Day. They no longer live amongst each other. Um, Hamtramck in Detroit, which was once a Polish enclave, is now Muslim, almost entirely Muslim, um, except for that huge Catholic church that's right in the middle that has a priest that speaks more Polish than, than English. Anyway, so what does this mean? Uh, the geographic economic mobility meant that those ethno-religious ties were less important, and consequently, that the particularistic views about religion were rapidly changing. So for instance, let's think about how to get to heaven. Classic question. At this point, um, Americans just shrug as if there's any particular way 
um, to get to heaven. They say there's lots of different pathways to get to heaven. In fact, if you, when you ask people, and Pew did, um, they say you don't even have to believe in God to get to heaven, at least among a plurality of people. So it wasn't just the economy um, in the suburbs that were driving this new tolerance. And this was something that Billy Graham railed against in Christianity Today in 1959, talking about the over-tolerance and moral issues that's made us soft, flabby, and devoid of conviction. In part, Graham was also reacting to the ecumenical movement that likely reached its apex in the mainline Protestant cultural domination of the 1940s and 50s. At that point, prominent Christian groups um, this is way before the ELCA, of course, but LCA, ALC, saw an opportunity to press toward unification of the Christian church. And you couldn't blame them for trying, given the building boom of churches and religious affiliation that wouldn't peak for at least another 40 years. But that meant that Graham was wrong for thinking that Americans were becoming tolerant of unbelief. That wasn't going to happen for at least another 50 years, if it happened, has happened at all. But also it means that the ecumenical movement was a vast overreach because it missed the essential character of religion and society going forward, which centered on the individual. So this is the challenge presented by tolerance. It's the vast increase in the ability of individuals to choose their groups or to choose none at all. The first to get hit with this, um, this new tolerance were those that were on the front lines of the ecumenical movement. A lot going on here. Um, <laughs> So I'll help you by showing you the main line. Um, sorry, this is at least part the ELCA um, is, is part of this. You'll see more specific numbers later, um, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, um, some Methodists. Uh, they used to be the dominant group in the United States, well above 30%, and now they are about 10% um, of the population. Um, others are doing lots of different things. The one thing that the big story um, that's happened in American religion across this time, of course, is the growth of the nuns, the non-religious, the non-affiliated. Non-affiliated is better than non-religious, and I'll tell you more about that later. Um, but I want to emphasize what else is going on here, which is the, the, um, the resilience of, and especially new religious forms that are cropping up at the same time. Of course, there's you know, lots of congregations that are thriving. There's lots of areas of the United States where religion is, is still um, a dominant force. Of course, we're standing in one of those. Um, but the writing has been on the wall for the length of my lifetime. So we're going to focus on some of those new religious forms rather than giving another talk on the nuns. So across this time, congregations really couldn't rely on habitual affiliation to lock in members and had to get better and even professionalized about attracting and retaining attenders. And what's interesting, and I use that term um, specifically here, is that there's a shift now to um, people aren't thinking about their religious membership, aren't thinking about their religious connection in terms of membership, but rather just in attending. And so people are much more free to float between congregations in that way. Um, fewer and fewer are saying that they're members, even though attendance hasn't been a changing as much. So it's no surprise to see the growth of megachurches in this period. Some were denominational, some were not, many were not. Um, these are massive congregations. The official definition is over 2,000 um, attendees where you can find every possible interest to form a community with. Um, so they still have huge corporate worship in large auditoriums with high production value, tons of people on the stage doing various things. Um, but the success of the megachurch is by making that big church small through all kinds of small groups and activities. Um, car repair group, volleyball league, divorcees of every age group, and so much more. Um, it sounds almost exactly like a college campus, as we were just talking about before the talk, that um, there are so many different things for students to be involved in, and that is a, you know, one of the selling points um, for coming to a place like this is that you can be. So we compete, you know, the, the parallels here with colleges are, are kind of perfect, right? Um, we compete on amenities, choice of majors, you have 50. Um, Denison, by some creative accounting, has 54, so you got to step it up. Um, and, you know, tons of involvement opportunities here, and that's exactly what megachurches are doing and what some of the many um, traditional churches are unable to compete with. So they're only 0.5% of all congregations, but 10% of Americans are attending a megachurch. They've grown 34% since 2015, and they're expanding by franchising campuses, by helping plant other churches, um, 
and they're not engaging as much with political affairs. So there are exceptions. Um, you might know Bob Jeffress's First Baptist in Dallas that's just extraordinarily political, um, just explicitly a, a Christian nationalist congregation, but most are not as political um, as other smaller churches. If these sound like micro denominations, you'd be right. They're generating their own local identities. So, you know, First Lutheran does not have one of those little window stickers, but Rock City Church absolutely does. They're supplying clergy, they're publishing, they're writing their own doctrine, like Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. Um, but unlike Donamish, so I'm gonna criticize them just a little bit here. Um, they typically are not founding enduring institutions like this one or hospitals um, or other things. They just don't have the kind of lasting impact on the landscape that denominations do. And they also don't engage in democratic governance, right? So megachurch leader-centric models have often gotten them in a bit of hot water. Think of uh, people like Mark Driscoll, the decline of the worldwide Hillsong Church and the scandal at Willow Creek are just examples um, where that lack of democratic governance has gotten them in trouble. So it's interesting to see that non-denominational churches are growing. Um, so this just boils it down to three to make it a little bit easier to see. And across the 1970s to 2018, uh, non-denominationals used to be a rarity, one to two percent. Um, of people were affiliated with a non-denominational church. By the time we hit 2018, we're talking about 12%, so a huge increase in non-denominationals. And you can see that it's almost a direct substitute for uh, denominational evangelical. So while evangelicalism, um, based on identity or what have you, is, is almost stable through this period, um, there's really a vast substitution growing um, that non-denominationals are growing and denominationals um, are not. Just because I thought this would be fun, um, we can see what this, what this looks like over time. So uh, you can see the portions of North Dakota that are obscured by snow. Um, <laughs> couldn't help it. Um, there's some out there, and this is 2010, so this isn't all that long ago, um, but by 2020, still there's a lot of snow obscuring North Dakota, um, but huge increases um, across the country. Not evenly, of course, across the country, but it's still growing. Um, Ohio happens to be a hotbed, so we don't quite understand exactly why some of these places are growing and others are not. There's not much in the Northeast, um, but Ohio and the Northwest and Florida and Texas and Oklahoma are growing, but vast increases across um, a huge portion of the country. Um, not many in Minnesota. You can see, I think that's the, is that the Twin Cities, a little dark? Probably. Not here, this one. Yeah, so just to, just to boil it down and get some concrete numbers here. Um, Big portions, relatively speaking, in Alabama and Ohio is 8%. I swear, every time I go for a bike ride, I think, wasn't that a Presbyterian church last week? And now it's, you know, it's Rock City Church or something. Um, South Dakota is big, but, but North Dakota is not. So interesting why there's variation. We have a book that we're, we're um, talking about um, in development about non-denominationalism. And one of the things we have to do is try to account for these patterns. Why is it growing some places and, and not others? But I just thought it was fun to, to take a look at this. Sorry. So I actually could go on and on, um, and if you want to, we can talk about this later. I, I really value denominations. I love federated membership structures. Um, I study those, obviously, as a political scientist. That's the United States, and denominations mirror that. I think they have tremendous benefits for society. But doing denominationalism is just hard work these days, and perhaps they invite too many problems and come with too few benefits to stay for the long haul, and I apologize for saying that. Um, does the average attender see much benefit in that national structure? Do they know about and value Lutheran social services? I suspect some do, um, but does everybody? Do they know that the denomination is able to fund a lobby office? Sorry, um, advocacy office. I was corrected last evening. Um, do they know that they have that in Washington and in the States? 
No, they actually don't. I've actually asked um, ELC members, and at one point they had no idea what I was talking about. Um, and sometimes those denominations are aggregating political problems that are more easily resolved with exit rather than voice or loyalty, especially given what I've been talking about when those boundaries to leaving and switching are so low. So when the ELCA voted to permit openly gay clergy and committed relationships in 2009, Estimates are that the denomination lost about 10% of its membership in churches. Uh, the ELCA kind of, it's, you can't see the, you can't see the, the dots in there, um, but the ELCA kind of fell off a cliff starting in, in 2000, and it's been pretty steady since that point. Right around um, when they made this decision, you can see that the, the, the points dipped a little steeper, but then it resolved the same course that it had been following before. But the ELCA is no different than the rest of the main line here. The UMC is, and also the UMC is currently calving a new denomination, the Global Methodist Church, stemming from their LGBT policy fight. The SBC, so going to the other side and thinking about evangelicals, are also um, suffering decline when they had been steadily growing ever since their founding in the early 1800s. They finally reached peak um, and have declined, lost two million members um, over the last 10 years or 20 years. They're also thinking about ap amputating a sizable body part because they ordain women as pastors. And this includes their most famous megachurch, Rick Warren's Saddleback in California. One could see and understand why a local pastor would rather avoid these larger political questions that just crop up seemingly uncontrollably in which almost demands stance taking that can divide fragile congregations. And it's also no wonder that non-denominational churches are growing so rapidly. The one that, can you see the one that's, that's going the other direction? That's the Assemblies of God. Um, if I can sort of gloss over, you know, sort of the essence there, they, they are not sort of an idea-driven denomination, but more a feeling and spirituality-driven denomination. That serves to avoid a lot of the fights that are trying to discern what a particular message is for public policy, um, and that seems to be appealing to people. But every single mainline denomination here is facing incredible steep declines across this period. I want to go back, back to this one. Um, there's just something about the mid-1990s that seems really critical for how religion has changed across this time. Um, and so this, this graph puts the question really directly. What is it about the mid-1990s that would cause the nuns to grow, denominational evangelicals to decline, and non-denominationals to increase. Well, the conventional, anybody want to take a guess what was special about 1994? I know you know. This is when Republicans took control of the House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years. And as part of that, this isn't necessarily about the Republican Party, but it is about the Christian right, which played a very visible role in that election. So while some of their agenda was popular, of course, um, not all of it was, and certainly to particular parts of the population. I'm thinking, you know, I mean, it became increasingly unpopular across the next 25 years, thinking specifically about gay rights. So this is now the second great political challenge for religion, um, the challenge of politicized religion. So I just want to put a side note here. It's um, super interesting why evangelicalism seems so easy to co-opt politically compared to, say, the mainline or to the Catholic Church. I'm just going to put a pin there. If you're interested in asking about that later, that would be super. But I want to keep moving. Um, so I want to challenge this just for a second. It never made all that much sense to me why the Christian right caused people to leave religion. So think about the main line is the one that's declining fast across this period. Why would the Christian coalition being so conservative cause somebody to leave a Presbyterian church? It doesn't make any sense, right? That's, that style of politics is, what's not, is not what's happening in the main line, but happening outside. So what I do buy here is that's not causing people to leave churches but it's causing those who are just legacy identifiers, those who have already left churches, they're kind of off by themselves. The one thing they see in the media is the Christian coalition saying something ultra conservative and saying, okay, I'm gonna lose my legacy identity. I don't wanna be associated with that anymore. They may have left the label, 
but that doesn't mean that all those individuals were no longer religious. So one bad assumption about identity is that we presume that it governs everything else. And that's true here, it doesn't. Life is much more messy than that. So in 2023 data, data that just came out of the field, about 30% of the nuns, those who don't identify, don't say they affiliate, but they still attend worship services. About a third believe in heaven or hell, and about a quarter take on some other religious identity, such as spiritual. There were other protest movements against the Christian right that surged a bit and declined, and one of them was the emergent church. Anybody heard of the emergent? Some have heard of the emergent church, yep. People were super interested in, in religion. So this emerged within evangelicalism. It was thought as a great threat um, to evangelicalism, and it was a radical way of doing, of redoing church. It was not at all national, it was hyper-local, the community was the church, and worship didn't so much feature sermons so much as discussion and full participation of those in attendance. It was explicitly anti-religious authority where clergy did their best to step out of the way of those meeting if they were clergy at all. Kind of organizers might be a better, better sense. There was really no doctrine to these, to these um, congregations as well. Instead, they generated their own commitments based on discussion. So they called themselves a postmodern church. Um, there were instances of this across the country. It seemed like it was taken off. There were lots of new books that were selling very well. Rob Bell is a name that may ring a bell. See how I did that? Funny. Thanks. I'll get you back later. Yeah. Um, so that may not, so I found in recent data, this data that just came out of the field, I found 1% of Americans still identified as emergent. That may not sound like much, but that's the same size in the data as the PCUSA, as Presbyterian Church. So that's a huge number of people, relatively speaking. I can't guarantee that all these emergent identifiers are actually attending emergent churches, but still, there's a, a decent number of people um, affiliated with that. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I can keep going with that for a long time, but I want to get to the third and then uh, take your questions. So switching gears, it seems, I think everybody feels this. Um, I definitely know that our students are feeling this as they have some reticence of engaging in politics. It seems like politics is getting in the gears of everyday life, um, especially since the post-civil rights world and definitely in the last decade. This is the third great political challenge, the intrusion of politics into everyday life. So my species, the political scientist, has found that society is sorting based on their partisanship and it affects dating, colleges, workplaces, neighborhoods, shopping, basically everything. Strong negative emotions are recruited by media and political elites to classify the other party as an evil threat to the nation. And this is what people say in surveys. So it's no surprise the social choices of all sorts are affected. So for instance, during the Trump years in DC, it was apparently difficult for young Republicans to find dates. And so they had to come up with their own conservative dating apps, one of which was named The Right Stuff. <laughs> in the 50s, it wasn't this way. And it was relatively uncommon for parents to be upset about the possibility of their offspring marrying someone from the other party. So 1959, Gallup found 28% wanted their kid to marry a co-partisan, 72% didn't care. But these days, a majority want their child to marry within the party while only 45% don't care. So totally understand why you don't wanna have political disagreements over the Thanksgiving dinner, even though I encourage that my students to experiment, bring it up, see what Uncle Ed has to say. Um, but there probably are deeper concerns than that. So this is one thing that I've tried to do is track the degree of threat that our people are feeling from the other side. And I'm taking seriously the kinds of claims that politicians are making um, ex explicitly from, from Donald Trump. So um, there's a belief among a majority of Republicans that a Democratic administration would strip them of their religious freedom. 43% of Republicans agreed that Democrats would ban the Bible. This is in 2023, two years into the Biden administration. Just as troubling, 39% of Americans and almost a majority among Republicans say that they have heard someone say that the enemy is demonic and we need to stand our ground. And this is in the context of a partisan, partisan enemy. It's no surprise that the people who hear this message are more likely to say that they would want to secede from the US with other like-minded people. 
how did we get to such a polarized place? Well, one of those stories is that politics is steering the religious life cycle. So college plays a central role here. The tumultuous college years where people are moving away from home creates this break in religious affiliation and involvement. And at the same time, their politics are solidifying so that when they emerge from college, so the story goes, their politics are settled and then they make religious decisions. So given that they're hanging, liberals are hanging with liberals and conservatives with conservatives, they do the thing that's stereotypical for that group. Liberals go to non-religion, conservatives go back to religion if they ever left. If that replicates across time and space, it explains why we're so polarized, right? They, partisanship settles and then they go off and make religious decisions. My research suggests that it's just, that's wrong and it was limited really to the boomers. Blame boomers for everything. A lot going on here, but there's two places where we can see the the pattern about the religious life cycle mattering. And one is up high there for for people that were born in 45 to 49. Religious affiliation starts low and then it climbs. Same thing for those 50 to 54. So boomers, it works. Every other generation here, there's no evidence for the religious life cycle operating, and why would that be the case? Well, what I think is um, that stability suggests two things. It could be just a turnstile religion where a number of people are going in and going out at the same time, but probably it means that there's individual level stability. And if people are maintaining during such a polarized time as we've been experiencing, that says we have to look inside congregations to understand what they're doing to keep people. And that's really interesting, at least to me. So one thing we found in the wake of the ELCA decision on LGBT clergy, um, when I surveyed clergy, is that they, were, um, that they were holding meetings to discuss it. So not surprising that congregations are holding meetings, especially in the main line. Um, but one of the ways that they set it up was interesting. So they tried to run them like deliberative forums. So that term deliberation, you may have heard of it, maybe not. Um, but it actually means something very tangible and concrete. It means emphasizing norms of mutual respect, of turn taking, of intentional listening, listening and full participation. These are the gold standards of democratic decision making. And they're used often to process intentionally, intensely difficult questions. And of course, the extension of gay rights and denominations qualifies as intensely difficult. What's important here is that most studies of deliberative forums, um, not necessarily in churches, but everywhere, finds that participants really like that process. They become more interested in civic affairs, and they want to participate in more such experiences. And if that sounds ideal, of course, it's because it is. And it sounds like exactly the kind of thing that clergy or really any leader would want for their organization. And adopting these deliberative norms has not been limited to the fallout of denominational decisions, because in other studies, we found that congregations ap appear to adopt these deliberative norms to govern their small group infrastructures as well. That is, they understand that explicitly they will emphasize those four, those four norms. Of course, they're most commonly adopted by mainline Protestants who are more diverse anyway and least by evangelicals, but they are clearly being used to bridge political divides. I wish I could offer you direct evidence that they were successful in that. I can't. Um, what I can say with great confidence comes from looking at what people who disagree with their congregation decide to do. So it's important to know that there is a lot of disagreement in congregations. This is just comparing um, how the respondent feels about Trump as just one kind of anchor point versus how they think about their congregation. And you can see there's a big spike in the middle, so there's a decent amount of agreement, but there's also a lot of folks who kind of move off to the tail where they disagree um, with their congregation. So what do they do? Do they all just go head for the door? They don't. And instead, their disagreement is counterbalanced by their involvement. Right? So those who are involved in the life of the congregation, either they ignore that disagreement, they overlook it, or even come to enjoy the diversity of the views offered. Only those on the margin who attend at low rates who don't participate in the other groups and activities tend to wander off to other pursuits when they disagree. Skipping a little bit. 
but I want to emphasize I've talked a lot about um, about conservatives um, and also there's a lot of talk about liberal religious nuns I want to say that religious that leaving congregations happens both on the left and the right so we found that disagreement over Trump drove some conservatives who weren't on board the Trump train out of their churches. We found the same thing in 2006 in Ohio when there was a Christian right candidate on the ballot for governor. Republicans who were not fans of the Christian right were more likely to leave their churches, but only when they were marginal affiliates. All told, Pew has found something like 45 to 50% have shifted denominations since they were age 16. So a tremendous amount of change there. But this also undercounts church movement because we found and consistently across multiple studies now that 15 to 20 percent have left a congregation within the past three to six months so every half a year or so 15 to 20 percent are moving congregations which is a tremendous amount of churn in the religious economy so what do they do next this is this still surprises me um, what seems clear, again, is that their identity is not driving the next steps they take. So because I do a lot of surveys, I'm able to just indulge my whims. And after the standard religion question, what is your present religion, religion, if any, I decided to ask if the church they now attend matched the religion that they just gave us as their identity. And it turns out that 20% said that no, it does not. A fifth of Americans are attending a congregation that does not match their religious identity. Some of that's due to the nuns, of course, if a nun is attending a congregation, they're obviously not matched to their, to their identity, but still it was 20% among mainliners, it was 20% among evangelicals. So there's a lot of identity congregation mismatch, which suggests the degree of churn and how much people are willing to, to, to innovate. So one of the implications from the finding is it seems like is that clergy should avoid politics like the plague. Um, in accords with that common statistic, maybe you've heard from Pew, that 63% of Americans want churches and other houses of worship to keep out of political matters. But I think that's the wrong question to ask and definitely does not accord with what I see in the data, which is that clergy report addressing political issues at a serious clip and that attenders report hearing them. When I compared LCA and ALC um, clergy in the 1960s versus the uh, ELCA in the 2000s, I found political engagement actually increased across this time, which is not the conventional wisdom about what's going on. We also found that churches um, that have high levels of groups and activities tend to add political groups, which suggests to us that political engagement is actually a desirable benefit to church involvement. And when we asked that Pew question in a different way, we found much more support for churches that are engaged in politics, at least when it backs their agenda. I have some evidence for you, but what I can say, and I'll, I'll skip the graph, um, is that more engagement, even if there's disagreement, does not drive down satisfaction with their congregation, which suggests how important it is to get people involved the face-to-face -face social interactions um, that we know are so important, for instance, in college life. Okay, wrapping up. Council of American Religion that begin with long-running religious traditions that gradually socialize members born into the faith are increasingly inapplicable to the varied paths that individuals take through religion. And that doesn't even begin to address the identity complications of Americans. When you have Lutherans who don't realize that they're Protestants, Muslims and Catholics who identify as evangelicals, which there are in surprising numbers, you know that the rules have definitely changed. Some are going to consider these possibilities to represent breakdown, and that's true in a way. It's the breakdown of a religious order that relied on ethnocultural and even racial boundaries to keep denominational affiliations tight and lifelong. That's no longer true as tolerance for diverse others and multiple viewpoints has increased dramatically, if not completely. They represent the role of politics and organizations changing with the times that had previously been maintainers of an exclusive social order. And of course, it represents efforts of new religious organizations that are frankly just better at getting people in the door. To me, it shows a tremendous degree of religious resilience as religious ecosystems adapt to changes that are well beyond their power to control. And it's no doubt that this has and will continue to cause pain. But to borrow from the Mandalorian, this is the American way. Thanks. Thank you.
So here we go, we're on. Um, this is how it's gonna work. I'm just gonna queue up a couple questions right now for you, Paul, and then we'll break things open to the audience because I have to imagine after seeing all of those data, some of you might have questions. Um, just thanks so much, first of all, Paul, for walking us through all of that material. Things are really, really seem to be changing at quite a, quite a pace. And so I imagine folks are gonna be interested to ask questions. I also forgot to mention that we do have online uh, questions as well, or we can take online questions. And that's what I'll be monitoring here at, at the laptop. So just in case you're wondering, that's, what, that's what's happening. And if you do happen to be online, feel free to post those questions right there. Uh, you, you mentioned the AG, the Assemblies of God, which I don't know if you all are familiar with that language, but the Assemblies of God is the largest Pentecostal denomination within the US. And, and as you said, you know, it, if you walk into a Pentecostal church, it feels pretty different than walking into, say, a Catholic church, it often does, or a, or a Lutheran church, often much more focused on uh, the experience of the spirit, you might say. But there's, a, there's an interesting contrasting storyline there. So the Assemblies of God, and, I, and maybe other Pentecostal denominations as well, they're clearly seeing growth and have for some time. The main line in contrast is, has seen a significant decline. But the Assemblies of God and other Pentecostal denominations are not just growing in numbers, they're growing in diversity. And so, for example, uh, the, the Assemblies of God has nearly 20% Im, uh, immigrant population. Uh, I think um, uh, their number of African Americans is near 30%. And so in some ways, that denomination looks like many of the mainline want to look, but they don't go about diversification in the same way, <laughs> to say the least. So what, what is it about the resilience of maybe a, a group like the Assemblies of God and the lack of resilience that you see in the mainline? Like what's, what's actually happened? What's the story there? It's on. There, you there go. we go. Okay. Um, there's so much rich material there to, to dig into, and in some ways, you you kind of in some ways answered your own question. I, I think it's um, it's a style of doing religion that is sweeping the world, and so the dominant religious groups, say in Africa, are also Pentecostal, and have a message of empowerment um, that, of course, everybody wants to hear. If you walk into church and you find out that if you believe fervently that you can achieve pretty much all your dreams, which could be even material things, um, then that's an incredibly appealing sort of message. So, so another way of thinking about this is the spread of the prosperity gospel message, which seems in some ways really fringy and limited to a particular group of, um, of preacher sneaker uh, followers. But there's huge numbers of Americans that actually believe in some central components of this, including some mainliners. Um, so if you institutionalize that message that's empowering, that talks about the individual and how they can make things happen in their lives, um, it's no surprise that that's, that's appealing and, and growth-minded. Right. So I think that's at least part of it. There's lots of other things going on, but I imagine you have more questions. Yeah, maybe just one, one bit of a follow-up. You mentioned the way that we're sorting, uh, uh, how Americans are sorting one another, and there are all kinds of different ways in which we're sorting. One of those is through education. And so I lift that up because uh, within the Assemblies of God, over 50% of that denomination does not have a college degree. They're high school educated. Um, and so there's a, potentially a class story to tell there, whereas I think, I haven't double-checked the numbers here, I think within the main line, the number of college degrees is quite a bit higher. Um, so how do you see the kind of sorting happening along educational lines? And what does that say about kind of the future for American religion? Um, you, Sorry, again, if I, I asked the- No, it's great. <laughs> Classic reporter, just make sure you get all the facts in there and then and then your, your guests can affirm. Um, and so, so I would affirm that um, and it, it suggests that um, those, those new styles of reaching people with particular kinds of messages um, are gonna mean that you know the, the political ramifications going forward are going to change quite a bit. What's, what's sort of interesting, if I, can, if I can turn this around a little bit, um, is if, say, the Republican Party can change some of its, its stances to incorporate this growing diverse population that would be um, you know, uh, more, more conservative for sure um, and open, open to their appeals, but they have to change some of their policies first. Um, but that's that's a potential growth, and I can see that's how the the party system is going to change uh, going into the future. Maybe just one final question, then we can turn to to our audience here. You mentioned uh, the partisanship that I think all of us probably feel in our bodies and see also on on the news and other places. This is a college campus, right, and a college that really emphasizes the liberal arts. Does that tradition that you also teach within does that tradition offer any off ramps from 
that partisanship? Or maybe let me pose it in a different way. Does a liberal arts education provide us with a unique way to address the partisanship that you, that we all see and feel? Um, absolutely. Uh, and I think we've, those of us who are, who are faculty and hopefully our students um, have found the, the classroom, classroom as a refuge um, from the broader polarization. And at least in, in my surveys and when I talk to my students, they feel comfortable with expressing themselves and engaging with really difficult issues. Um, outside of that, maybe not necessarily, but the continued exposure that we have, I mean, this is where those, those groups and activities are incredibly influential because um, those are spaces where we cross partisan lines and class lines and racial lines, um, where they learn that kind of um, that kind of tolerance that's so essential for uh, for a democratic society. So the the extent to which we have students who are highly involved in in their campus um, is a way that we send those basic values out into the world. So I, sh I sure hope so. That's that's <laughs> at least why I one of the reasons why I stay in this game. We're betting on it, yeah. <laughs> Great, well we have, uh, I'd like to open things up. Ernie, we have a microphone right over there. Do you mind, or uh, we have one right over there by Jan. And uh, anyone else who would like to pose a question can go line up at the mic there. And we also have a question online that we'll tend to here in just a moment. Thank you. I, I'm sure you're familiar with this. There's a recent article in the uh, New York Times about the uh, browning, was the phrase that was used, the browning of Christianity internationally, and this is a shift that's been talked about for decades, but it's, it's occurring with the emphasis on the growth of Christianity in the African and South American, and to some degree even in the Asian and China uh, uh, context. And the emphasis, then the question is, well, what about the browning of Christianity in the United States? And you didn't talk about race, uh, <laughs> maybe delicately, I don't know, but it seems to me that, that one of the sub themes in, in this, this, this uh, fragmentation has also been this, this browning. This has also fueled Christian nationalism and white supremacy, uh, the attempt to try to hold on to white power and, and the like. So I guess that my simple question is, to what degree do you think the browning of Christianity will lead to a renewal of Christianity uh, in the United States with or without the demise of, of main lion, which has historically been white? Um, I, want, I want to tell you about um, a paper that um, a mentee of mine is doing, um, and it's a surprising sort of thing because we think of, when we talk about uh, Christian nationalism, we often sort of implicitly have white in, fr in front of it, and we think about, about white folks and white conservatives. Um, but African Americans and Latinos have the same proportion of Christian nationalist beliefs as whites do. And um, in an experiment, so the question is, why does this maintain, and, and do they do they have the same associations? And in research, uh, study after study, um, unless it's a specifically racial issue, uh, white Christian nationalists take the same stances as black Christian nationalists. Um, for instance, in research of mine, um, and, uh, Christian nationalism is associated with anti-Semitism at the same rates among whites and blacks. Um, the thing I wanted to tell you was uh, the, about this study was an experiment where um, African Americans were presented with uh, an explicitly sort of ethno-nationalist kind of statement that the United States should really, full, full citizens are, are, should only be white. I mean, it's a blatant kind of, kind of statement. And what's amazing about the response is that their blacks Christian national score went up. And so essentially, they were looking for ways to compensate um, for their citizenship being demeaned on racial lines by emphasizing the common ground of Christian nationalism. So there's some unintended consequences here about the sort of brownie of, Christ of, uh, of Christianity that may not just lead to a liberalism, and uh, it, there is going to be a civil rights component, of course, um, but could have common ground on a more conservative side because of the threats against um, the, the citizenship of, of African Americans. Really surprising stuff and explains why the Christian nationalism uh, maintains across time. There's lots of other things to, to talk about there. I mean, you know, there's... The, no. <laughs> no, but, but there's, a, there's a, 
it looks like there's a compensation kind of mechanism that means that it's going to maintain across time and some of the, the more conservative stances, aside from racial issues, um, are going to maintain across time. Lots of other things to say, but there's probably maybe some more questions to, to deal with. Yeah, and Pear, please feel free to make your way to the microphone. Before you pose your question, I'll pose an online question. Um, would you conflate, Paul, uh, prosperity gospel with the growth of Pentecostalism in the United States? Absolutely. Well, and I think that's, answer. <laughs> no, and I, th I think that I think that's true in in Africa as as well. I mean, that's the common denominator um, across these. Uh, looking at you know um, people who who have you know gone to churches in in Kenya are documenting the same sorts of. In fact, I gra I gab grabbed my scale that I use for the United States from research that people that people did in 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 Kenya, um, and it works the same way as it does in Kenya. So I think I think absolutely that that's the connection. So I want to go back to the topic of political polarization and how you see the, the mainline denominations involved with that. Because there's some you know, folks that say that without the robust involvement of the churches, that's, we're just never going to get out of this, this predicament. And the churches have to step up and be part of that sort of civil life. And then, but in the context of that, you were talking about the promise of a kind of deliberative ethos within these churches and the success that they can have in bridging difference and creating, um, engaging real conflict and yet without falling apart. I heard, I want to see if, if I heard you correctly there, at the same time that the average person will say politics has to stay out of the church. And the reason I'm asking about this is that the ELCA has had from the get-go, from its first social statement, a commitment to something called community of moral deliberation, developed a very sophisticated process to make that happen and, you know, executed 11 social statements and dozens and dozens of things at different levels. And yet, you know, I have to say that that whole practice, that whole spirituality hasn't really taken off. It doesn't, it, it's hard to get that going in a congregation. So on the one hand, there's this call to these churches to be agents of bringing people together in a safe space and being a model for society. And yet it's just not happening. And I wondered, whether you have any insight into that and any encouragement that for you know mainline denominations, um, it 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 happens enough to study, uh, so I can find examples. And what I was um, excited about when when the the two thousand nine decision was happening is that I got myself together and was able to execute a, a study of clergy to see how they how they dealt with it. Um, but but I think you're right, and in and in part, because some of it is invisible, and so th there's I have evidence that clergy change how they talk about issues when they face diversity. That they try to find um, arguments that they may not disagree with and process those at the same time that they're presenting ones they agree with, and it gives something to everybody. But then I don't know that they're they're necessarily having that neck that conversation that's next that would lead them to work through those those differences. Instead, I think it might be that there's something for everybody there, um, and so everybody feels okay without actually engaging. Um, so I, I agree with you that I think it's really difficult to get people to take the next step to actually process, unless there's some sort of perhaps denominational trauma that forces them to do that because the you know the existence of of the of the congregation right and staying with the denomination could be at stake um, so i think it's incredibly difficult for um, for churches to to say take these social statements and then translate that into um, you know a sustained series of 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 conversations um, in the congregation you know especially without those ethnocultural boundaries that say like i'm committed to this i'm going to stick stick with this right there's no alternative i need to keep going um it's too easy just to leave and say i'm, I'm going to find something else that's easier um so i yeah I, I i mean i think as a political scientist who studies you know, deliberation and in, in the success of democracy like having these debates is essential i don't know how we do that without these sort of boundaries that say you have to stay committed um, to this group. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. I wanted to follow up on the online questioner's line of reasoning about the 
overlap perhaps between the prosperity gospel and Pentecostalism, but take it in a slightly different direction. I'm interested in the tension potentially between the prosperity gospel and Christian nationalism, which you've been talking about, because I don't see those as the same thing. When I think prosperity gospel in the US context, right? I think like marble collegiate church, I think Norman Vincent Peale, power of positive thinking. Um, Norman Vincent Peale presided over one of Donald Trump's three marriages, at least one of them. And we know had a big influence on his, however vapid, outlook on public affairs. So is it worth making a meaningful distinction between the prosperity gospel and Christian nationalism as distinct currents in, I guess, right-wing Christianity with distinct origin points in American political development, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, it absolutely does. Um, and, and I agree that it's coming from a different place, although now, it seems that s at least some of those streams have converged. Um, so it's no longer, you know, sort of taken from from the main line, right? That it's it's clearly more more evangelical, and it's more um, on the Pentecostal side is where it's coming from. And this was the heart of Trump's Evangelical Advisory Council, where where folks that uh, like Paula White, for instance, I mean, really really well known. Um, uh, you know, megachurch preacher who sells prayer hankies for $79 online that have been prayed over. Um, but that, you know, that's, that's become, I think, a, a, a dominant stream that's, that's come to the mainstream um, and that's become more associated with Christian nationalism because it's, it's easy to, to emphasize the threat and the demonic nature that's, that's just outside the door and that you need to maintain this fervent belief. And if you have that, then you'll get the protection um, of God over you, right? So I think it comes hand in hand. It just seems like a sunny sort of thing, um, but it's understood, I think, that just outside the door, just outside your belief is threat, whether it's from a virus or from people who are sinning or from other demonic kinds of influences. Um, so Joel Osteen, as sunny as he is and always smiling and the perfect hair and all that, um, he also says you should not associate with, with people who are, are poor, with people who are sick, right? I mean, it directly undermines kind of a collective action and emphasizes this threat while also saying you have the agency to, um, to overcome. I think it's also, and this is, this is a, maybe a little bit far afield, I think it's also um, implicated in the shift of um, apocalypticism across this time period. And so the kind of premillennialist pre-millennialist notion that, you know, Jesus will come, will be raptured and meet him in the sky and all that kind of stuff used to be a very passive kind of understanding. We just need to sit and wait and make sure that we're right with the Lord. Um, but starting in the, in the 1980s, it became much more aggressive that we need to actually make this happen. And that's where you see the, the prosperity gospel become ascendant, right? So you, you have the power through belief to channel um, the Lord's intentions on earth. So that's where I think it starts to be to be linked because there's essentially political goals that, that need to be achieved um, across that time. So it's a lot of stuff, but, but that's where I, I see the connection. Yeah, that's great. We have a couple more questions. I do just want to signal it is one o'clock right now, and I know some of you have to depart. That's not a problem. We'll take a few more minutes to go through questions because it's obviously there's a demand. Uh, um, Dr. Solving, before you uh, jump on the mic there, I'm just going to pose one of our online questions. It's a, it's a big one, so take it where you want. Um, what caused the rise of the American right? And you identified the year 1994, right, which I think this is the year of Gingrich. Is, um, a, is that right, uh, yeah. House, um, House Speakership? And so how would you kind of narrate that history in sort of a 30,000 foot <laughs> view? Well, I mean, we can, we can look to, to all sorts of, of threats, and, and obviously one of them was, was in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, I think the first one that was most important was probably race, um, and was the challenge to segregated white Christian institutions in the South. And so the federal government getting involved actually led um, uh, what became the, it was the essence of the Christian right to get involved to oppose that. Um, and that shifted to abortion um, in the 1970s. So that was the first kind of, first couple of big threats um, 
But then, you know, sort of the, the, the further rise in the cementing was in the 1990s. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's the, the kind of cultural and political threat that we can find. The biggest one more lately um, has been the o Obergefell decision in 2015 legalizing same-sex marriage. That, that clearly signaled to Christian conservatives that they were in the minority in the United States. You can see all kinds of changes about how they were talking about politics and, and the nature of their politics at that point. Thanks for just kind of dividing that up into nice, neat chapters. That's actually helpful. Dr. Silving. This is poorly framed. I'm sorry. I'm thinking, trying to think with, first of all, the issue of religious resilience. And I think about, you talk, we focus pr primarily on Christian denominations. What about other faiths and the resilience in, in, the, in the society of those particular groups? But I think of Judaism and, and particularly Islam in this country. And that fits into this question really of how we might collaborate in building or sustaining um, democratic institutions in this country. Uh, do we have, we have a common interest in that? Can we, can we think about that in a way of, of bridging and building collaboration? I don't know. So this this was the role of uh, of the political parties, but also you know you can see the the ecumenical and interfaith movements um, in the 1950s, and there was a, an explosion for a while of of clergy interfaith efforts at at you know, local level and state levels and, and national levels. So I mean that that happened to a time um, you know obviously it's collapsed um, since that point, but there's obviously still still ways to work together, and you can see some of that in in religious freedom politics. Um, so signing on together in Supreme Court cases, um, there's some collaborative work. There's even some attempts of Christian conservatives to work on and support cases by, by Muslims. Um, and so you know, that's a place where some of those nascent efforts can, can perhaps um, move forward. We've just been experimenting with um, actually presenting those kind of scenarios to average people to see if that would, say, weaken their Christian nationalism effort and boost tolerance for, um, uh, for, for diverse others. And we're finding that there, there is a little bit of evidence that that happens. Not much, of course, but this is a survey experiment, so it's not real and tangible. Um, so we do think that there are those possibilities going forward. Um, but, but it's hard when the rhetoric is so charged um, and the, the, the Christian nationalism is so explicit. Um, so that, you know, if it ratcheted back to a pan-religious kind of, you know, civil society approach, then I think there's much more room for this to, to happen, but um, not in the near term. So this is really deep, and I'm really not used to that. <laughs> uh, so forgive me if I refer to my notes here, but um, if our communities are getting more and more diverse in every way, uh, and denomination equals doctrine equals stringent yes or no rules, is it surprising that dominations are declining? with the exception of seemingly the one that is embracing diversity, the assembly of God? And is this more an issue of tolerance versus intolerance? There's a lot that's deep. Um, so yeah, no, I, I think so. Um, So I mean, there's there's a way to to object to it because I mean, clearly within the main line, there's at least you know um, qu quite a bit of commitment to tolerance and to diversity. Um, they're not exactly great at <laughs> at bringing those at those folks in, as as Michael noted earlier, but but the ideology is there and the theology is there. Um, so I don't think denomination necessarily means that, but it certainly says that. That, that messaging is important, right? And not just having that ideology that we are committed to diversity isn't sufficient. Um, that there's clearly a lot of work that needs to be done to figure out how to actually get people in the door and what actually appeals to them. Um, but ideology isn't necessarily gonna be the way to do it. I think that's the what the AOG, the Assemblies of God is, is suggesting is it's not really an ideological kind of denomination um, and you know really free, free flowing and, and able to to morph into what works for that particular community um, 
you know, that's, there's not faith statements there. Um, and that suggests something entirely different. Um, but that I think also is, is what, is why we have the success of, of non-denominational churches is they're so incredibly flexible um, and think about messages uh, and they're committed to the, the messages that work that may be frustrating to people, <laughs> but, but it also suggests that what works. I don't think that did justice to your question, but that's what I got. Thanks, that was a good question. Um, let me take a few online questions here. Uh, somebody's asking about Robert uh, Wuthno's most recent book, Why Religion is Good for American Democracy, and wondering if you've had a chance to take that in or, or not, no? Okay, that's fine, no big deal. Um, so on to the next question. Uh, why are mainline seminaries and churches having such difficulty attracting young men, uh, say between the ages of 18 to 40? And I'll just testify, having been within the seminary space in, uh, for the, almost the last decade, uh, that, what, that, was a, that is true in terms of enrollment numbers, that it is becoming increasingly more difficult to recruit run, young men into that space. So any thoughts on that? It's hard to get young men to do anything. <laughs> um, well, I mean, so so uh, I think like uh, academia, uh, denominational religion has also um, had more, has been more and more attractive to women across time. I mean, the professorate is rapidly changing. Um, political science was once heavily male and now is getting close to, to parity in terms of men and women. Um, so that that shift, I think, is is also apparent in, in, in the clergy. It's not seen as necessarily masculine. Um, and maybe that's a good thing, but that also has consequences for, for attracting, uh, you know, equal numbers of men and women. So, the, I mean, the, the church always goes through this. There was a crisis in the early 1900s, and this was the, the, the solution was to have the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, and, and have a more muscularized Christianity. So, I mean, the church kind of constantly goes through these, these periods of having that sort of crisis. So I don't think that's necessarily new. Last question. Yeah. Oh, last question. <laughs> oh, thank you, Paul. That was uh, incredibly informative. And uh, my question is kind of follows up on Michael Chan's first question, which was about uh, how to foster more of the civil engagement, political engagement of students here at, uh, at Concordia. You mentioned that liberal arts is a, provides a, a good place, a good refuge for that. But I'm thinking more fine-grained kind of recommendations. Are, are there any... Is there any data you mentioned earlier about the life cycle? Is, are, is there any specific things that you could, recommendations for a place like Concordia to foster that? So yeah, obviously I haven't seen the data at Concordia, but from what I see at Denison, um, there's an incredible amount of political participation. And in part, um, it's linked to the, the ability to you know, foster leadership and involvement in these you know, kind of small groups and activities. So the more that we just, create a space for students to do, you know, kind of what they do best, um, given who we attract to our colleges, just be leaders, have ideas, explore it. Um, and that has a natural corollary to political involvement. I mean, they want to be engaged, they want to actually have an impact um, on society. And so if we if we emphasize that, um, that, you know, there are opportunities to do that, that they can make a difference, just like they're they're changing the campus right? Um, with their ideas, they can also go out into society and do those exact same things. It seems like the, the natural connection, especially when we're emphasizing that there is that connection. Um, so that's continually what I do. Um, that's what the data suggests as well. So I don't think we necessarily need to do anything different. Um, what we've been doing for a long time means that our, our alums go out and they're very engaged in their communities, in their states, in their nation, um, and trying to change it for the better. Well, will you all please join me in thanking Dr. Jupe? Paul, thank you so much for just an, an insightful presentation, uh, insightful conversation, and just so grateful for the work that you continue to do. I hope people will check out the two blogs uh, that you want. And remind us one more time of, of what they are so we have. There's religioninpublic.blog and 127 written out. Uh, O-N-E-127 dot blog. Great. And just a few announcements. There's going to be a, a slide coming up here in a moment. We're already building out our program for next year, 
Uh, this, this is actually the last of our speaker series for the year. We will have a number of summer events coming that are going to be off-site, in fact, still live streamed and all of that. Uh, you can stay tuned by uh, uh, signing up for our newsletter and you'll receive those announcements. But I wanted to give you a little bit of a preview of our speakers for the fall of next year, two of them. The first I'll begin on the left is Dr. Ben Danielson, clinical professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington. And uh, he's just a remarkable communicator and somebody who's doing a lot of work around health equity. Uh, so he'll be joining us. And then on the right, Dr. Scott Winship, Senior Fellow and Director uh, for the Center on Opportunity and Social Mobility at the American Enterprise Institute. So he does a lot of work on poverty and on social capital and on how to uh, in increase opportunities for people to, um, uh, to move up the economic chain. So should be very interesting things. Again, go to the LawrenceandCenter.com website, sign up for the newsletter so you can get all of our, uh, all of our updates. Again, Paul, thank you so much for your... Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for Thanks, hanging everyone. in there.